Let, let's talk about the money because definitely uh, Black Lives Matter organization pulled in a lot of money in, in 2020. I mean, kind of like stunning, stunning amounts of money uh, for organizing. Um, some of it from small donors, like maybe the kind that, that, that you know, both groups that you just described, um, but then also some pretty massive money from philanthropists, foundations. All of them from very well, a lot of it from Nike and companies that you have to wonder why they're giving um, Black Lives Matter so much money. But, but also a lot of it's from foundations, philanthropic foundations, that have been supporting leftist causes for a long time. And, and just to be clear, there's, there's kind of an, it's not always direct, right? This, the way this money flows, it's kind of an op op a bit opaque. Well, it's, inc it's incredibly opaque. You give your money to, to Act Blue, which then takes a cut and gives the money to, for example, the Tides Center, Tides Foundation, mm -hmm. which is a financial sponsor of BLM GNF. Mm. So, so Act Blue is one layer, then the money goes to, 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 to Tides Center. And, and, and BLM GNF has no need, no, no legal need to be transparent with what it does with the money. Or, or you have Warren Buffett's family, his son uh, uh, Peter, or the Soros family, his son Alexander. Um, or you have the Alliance for Global Justice, which was actually started by people who were in Nicaragua. And so they need to say, no, go back to your country and change your country. And sure enough, they have, or well, they're attempting to. These are all longtime supporters of the left. And so you, you do mention in, in the book that uh, a lot of these big donors, you know, clearly the, the money was raised very much through capitalist means. It's money that comes from, uh, uh, you know, capitalism being employed, but being used to effectively subvert capitalism a, a, as a goal. Yeah, I, I believe it was 1972 when the grandson of Henry Ford, Henry Ford III, finally walked out of the Ford Foundation, left, left him a letter saying, all this money that you use for anti-capitalist causes was created by capitalism. I think we should be able, you should be aware of that. Uh, and again, I'm not a psychologist. I don't really understand what motivates somebody who's made money in a for-profit company. The thing the communists hate, profit. The fact, you know, alienating labor and alienating surplus value, that's what profit is. And that's the thing they hate the most. Um, well, all that money was created by surplus value. And, uh, and yet they're using it to kill this, the system that produced it. So what's really interesting is that a lot of these, I guess, policies, you know, advocated by um, the BLM organizations, and so where they ostensibly the idea is to alleviate poverty. They're supposed to basically create actual social justice, but you argue that, that they kind of do the opposite. Well, when you look at the, the, the surplus murders in 2020, which the media, the New York Times, the Atlantic, and the rest of the media are trying to say, was, well, it's COVID. No, it wasn't COVID. The rest of the world had COVID. The rest of the world had lockdown. The rest of the world had people losing their jobs, the mystery that came with COVID, they haven't had uh, an increase in the murder rate. In fact, in England, murder rate went down. And it's been documented how in the cities where Black Lives Matter held protests between Ferguson in 2019, sorry, in 2014 and 2019, how the murder rate went up in these places by between 1,000 and 6,000 additional murders in these places between 14 and 19. So, so, and again, as I said before, African-Americans make up 54% of the victims of homicide. I don't know how you're helping black, black lives if black lives end, end up being murdered at a higher rate because of your actions, the CRT. And there's the fact that, for example, with a family, as I said earlier, having an intact family is the, the surefire ticket to success. It's not a guarantee that you're going to succeed if you, if you had an intact family. But boy, is it helpful, the statistics show. And yet, Black Lives Matter wants to dismantle the family and I suppose adopt other models 
Well, what has shown to work is your mommy and the daddy working in tandem with each other, you know, helping her, she helping him, and they're both helping the children. And if you want to dismantle that, the basic unit of society, how, how, do, ma how do lives matter to you? What, what would you say was the most surprising things you learned as you were researching this book and you were researching all these different relationships with these organizations and so forth? The fact that they're so candid about admitting things and the media is so reluctant, or not even reluctant, the media just will not cite them or quote them. They minimize, uh, overlook the things they say about themselves or politifact saying, well, Marxism today means looking at life through an economic lens. That's just a falsehood, an outright falsehood by PolitiFact. I look at life through an economic sense, and I am no Marxist. That was astonishing to me, and it still continues to astonish me, the fact that they're candid about what they want to do and who they are, and the media is so uncandid. In fact, they want to do the opposite. They want to make who they are opaque and what they want to do opaque. They hide it. That continues to, I, because I was a journalist for 20 years, and the fact that they don't report on this, when they report, they say, well, Marxism today just means things through the economy. No, that's not true. The Wall Street Journal does that. Wall Street Journal is not communist. You know, and also, I guess, I mean, your your background is, uh, you know, your family comes from here, you come from Cuba. I was right? born in Cuba, and I lived in Cuba for the first 12 years of my life. I have a first-hand experience with with communism. I also have a first-hand experience with, with fascism. We moved to Francisco Franco, Spain, where I lived, where I experienced a kind of a fascism light. You know, Franco in his waning years, the oppression was there, but it, it was it was not freedom. And then I, I experienced freedom in this country at the age of 14. And I fell in love with America ever since. But as a foreign correspondent, I also lived in many, many countries. I lived in at least a year in seven countries. I covered Korea and lived in Korea, for example, between the early 80s and early 90s. As Korea was making the transition between a military-ruled conservative dictatorship to a democratic society. So I've seen, I've been around the clock. I've been, I've been around the block a couple of times. And I've been able to contrast and compare. And that has aided me greatly in, in my analyzing our lives here. Well, and so, you know, we have, I don't know, numerous people who have lived in these communist systems, basically saying like, for example, there's, there's people I, I know who are saying that you, you see elements of the cultural revolution even right. in what we're seeing today. Right, which, you know, and other people will say, oh, how, how could you possibly say that? So many people died, you know. Yeah, very much so. I mean, the fact that I covered China helped me a great deal. The fact that I covered, I lived in Hong Kong for eight years. I got to read up a lot, study the Cultural Revolution, the struggle sessions. I think that was a great aid in my being able to recognize the, the anti-racism trainings that our corporations are going through now, uh, which are very racist in themselves, as a form or a, or a descendant of the same common ancestor of the, the struggle sessions that Mao had in, in, in China. And so, and so how is, you know, anti-racism training racist? Well, I mean, when Ibn Kendi, the most famous anti-racist, says we need to have discrimination now, we have to discrimination in the future and forever, he means racial discrimination. That's racist. When you separate kids according to affinity groups, by the way, let's understand what affinity means. It means race or national, or, or, or national origin or sex. That is racist, disgusting, and illegal. That's, that's not allowed by Title VI of, of the Civil Rights Act. That, that or, or to say to a white child, by your very nature, you perpetuate systemic racism, but to say to a black child, you know, reading and writing, love of literacy, punctuality, sitting in your desk uh, and learning, these are white things. This is, this is, you should not culturally appropriate these, these. that's untrue, racist, would have made the, the, the grand dragon of the KKK blush 20 years ago if he had said it in public, and yet it's being said in public now all the time by people who call themselves anti-racist. The idea in critical race theory, which you're, you know, describing here, is that race is socially constructed, yet at the same time, it seems to be a kind of indelible stain 
on certain groups. Yeah, they addressed that uh, directly. I think Kimberly Crenshaw, or it was maybe Cheryl Harris or Patricia Williams, I forget, who, who actually wrote about, write about this. They all do. And they, they square the circle. They say, yeah, it's true that it's socially constructed, and yet it has an impact. This is when, when they start walking away from postmodernists. Because they say the postmodernists just mean just nothing is real, and we can deconstruct everything. And race is a construction, an artificial construction, and yet it matters greatly. It's the end all of everything. It's the alpha and the omega of life. So they themselves, every time somebody sells you a contradiction and tries to say it's, 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 it's not either or, but it's this and that, and they're both opposites, you, you, your cognitive system should experience system shutdown.